So the national interest is reporting that the F-15 EX can hold its own against fifth gen adversaries. But is that really true? All right, so a new report from the National Interest uh, about a week ago says the F-15EX can hold its own against the fifth-gen fighter. Plane's cost is still an issue, but the EX has proven to a significantly higher mission capable rate over the F-35 or a Lockmart F-22 Raptor. Cost-effective alternative to the F-35. Study found that it, the flyway cost was even higher than the F-35. Moreover, critics of the Boeing fight have argued simply a new model of an old warbird but with significant uh, combat record that includes more than 100 air-to-air -air kill. So they used the 2024 annual report. The director of operational tests and evaluation went through every program that the Air Force uh, or the DOD is testing and evaluating right now. And they went through and talked about what's going right, what's going wrong, what they can do better, some recommendations. And in this report, they said that it's counter to the argument that the F-15EX can't hold its own against the C-57 or the J-20 Mighty Dragon. Cost is still an issue. However, it's more mission capable than the F-35. It achieved 83% mission capable rate compared to 67 for all variants. And when we talk about mission capable, that doesn't mean... 40% or 38% or whatever are just sitting there and can't fly. FMC rates, the mission capability rates, are all systems go. Can it do every single mission perfectly? As every system on the aircraft work, which of course, things break. And the more complicated something is, the more you're going to have degraded systems or things not breaking. So it's not a, it's not really a, valid argument to be like, well, the FMC rate's pretty low. You have to look at the numbers and look at what systems it promised that aren't there yet, that we're waiting for, and stuff like that. So that's not really, okay, FMC rate's higher, but it also has fewer systems. And then they talk about it to being a future-proof warbird. So I thought we would look at the actual report, because I love going to the source data. So this is what the report looks like. It's a DOD report by the acting director, Raymond O'Toole Jr. of the Operational Test and Evaluation. So the first thing I wanted to look at, because they talk about all the sensors and the future proofing, one of the programs that they talked about is something that's pretty major on the F-15. It's the Eagle Passive Active Warning Survivability System. And in January of 24, last year, they completed the uh, initial operation test and evaluation for the ANALQ 250 V1, which is the Passive Active Warning Survivability System, EPOS. They obviously have a classified report, which we're not going to talk about because we don't want to go to jail. But um, performance is unknown in modern combat environments because they can't test it exactly. But it worked well where they did test it. So they said they should continue to improve it. It enables the air crew to identify, detect, locate, deny, degrade, disrupt, and defeat air and surface-to-air threats. So it's a self-defense system. And it's used in highly contested environments, something like Ukraine, or Russia, like if we went to war with China. It's a radar warning function, scans the radio frequency environment, provides the air crew with identification, location, information, potential threat signals, when necessary, can respond with countermeasures, including jamming and expendables, chaff, for example, to defeat a threat radar or missile. It integrates with the radar, which is the ESA radar that they have, uh, an advanced display core processor, mission computer, replaces the three legacy tactical uh, ALR-56 and the internal countermeasures. So it's this is like an all-in-one system for self-defense that will protect this aircraft. And it's used on not just the EX, but it'll be on the Strike Eagle and well, the Eagle's going away. So the Strike Eagle and that. So they did some tests and effectiveness training. They went down to Point Magoo. They went out to uh, various other places with sensors and found that it was operational effectiveness under conditions of the open air test ranges could produce 
So obviously there's some limitations, uh, infrastructure, um, threat replication, all that stuff. They couldn't 100%, but what they could test, it was pretty good and has improved uh, since the development, which they had a lot of built-in tests, false alarms and stuff like that. But they have some classified recommendations that are going to make it even better. It's survivable against cyber threats uh, emulated during this test. Cyber threats being the big next big thing. Uh, but they're continuing to improve it. And this is a big part of what makes the EX great, is this system right here. Because, yes, it doesn't have stealth, but it has survivability in other ways. And in my mind, that's what you need, is you have your 5th gen, 6th gen fighters, day one of the war, that are going to go in and be undetected. But you also need your missile trucks and aircraft that you can get a lot of, and carry a lot of missiles, but also be very survivable because you don't always need stealth. You don't always need to be undetected. There are some missions like the National Guard with Homeland Defense and stuff like that where you want survivability and not necessarily stealth, but you want to have all those sensors and stuff. So it's it's cool that they're having this upgrade and this is a big part of what's going to make the EX great. They've obviously got some more testing to do and stuff, but the EX itself. So here's the part where they were testing this aircraft for the mission and where they came up with the idea that it's still effective against fifth gen. So let's see if in context, that's what they said. So uh, what is the EX? Well, 2C twin engine multi-role aircraft of derivative of the Qatari F-15QA, which is a derivative of the Strike Eagle. It inherits modern advances such as fly-by-wire flight controls. And we've seen the demos. It's very highly maneuverable and does a lot of cool things that a standard Eagle might not be able to do. Dual digital helmet mounting queuing system, touchscreen displays, which we all think are cool these days. Uh, the EPAWS system that I just talked about. So it's going to be a multi-role capability. It's going to be air superiority initially, but then expand to multi-role. So kind of like the F-16. You know, not a pound for air to ground from the Eagle guys. Well, guess what? You're going to have to learn because we're going to do it all. Offensive counter air. So going out and being able to protect a strike package, going into bad guy land and and killing people and breaking their things. And then cruise missile defense, which I talked about with EPAWS. There are some squadrons, you know, you don't need stealth for that. You need the ability to have sensors that work together and can detect target track uh, different things. So Homeland Defense, it's a big mission for that. Escort of high-value airborne assets, uh, defensive counter-air, etc. Full complement of air-to-air -air weapons and has four additional air-to-air -air weapon stations compared to the E, so more missiles is more better. Limited capability to employ precision-guided air-to-surface munitions. So it's not really, I mean, they say not a pound for air-to-ground. They're still not really pointing their nose at the ground. They're dropping GPS-guided, maybe laser-guided bombs. They're not doing diving deliveries initially maybe they will who knows maybe they'll join the cool kits like the viper i don't know does viper still even do that maybe i'm old so uh it's an acquisition program rapid fielding because we need this we need more aircraft and we can build them faster than other aircraft can be built major contractors boeing and i talked about this in the last video about this is the one thing boeing's getting right they are not having the issues here that they've had with others. If you read this report, actually, and we can talk about this on either the Mover and Gonkey show or this channel, there are other programs like the T7, which are just disasters. Like they just can't seem to get it right. But for this one, it seems like it's doing well. Uh, the mission level testing, uh, they, they did some testing and it's the same thing with the EPAWS. They did what they could but they didn't do advanced longer range threat weapons becoming operational at the time of fielding. So they're going to have to do more as emerging technologies from other countries become a, a real threat and a real thing. But what it did test against, it worked, but there were limitations and they think that we should probably integrate it in the joint simulation environment to enable broader testing in a simulated environment so they can see exactly what they think you can do. Obviously did some classified studies and, and stuff like that, but they did a lot of testing at Eglin, which got some of the data to characterize performance. And then cyber attack, which we've talked about, is, is kind of a big deal uh, and brings up a risk assessment as well. So the performance, how did it do? 
It was able to detect, track all threats at advantageous ranges. So that's what you want to be able to do, right? See people far away, kill them before they know you're there. Then it doesn't matter if you're stealth or not. I mean, if you can reach out and touch them, good thing. Using onboard and offboard systems to identify, deliver weapons while surviving. No further operational testing is planned until test fleet is in the lot two configuration. Pilots had positive opinions on the cockpit usability. Pilot vehicle interface is something that's huge. We always talk about this. Can I relay what I want to do and make the aircraft do it as an extension of myself versus having to think, okay, how do I get to that? What switch? Pilots love easy. Hands on throttle and stick, stuff like that. You want to be able to just think and have it do versus trying to remember how to get to what menu to make it do what you're trying to do. So pilots loved it. Pilots I've talked to you have loved it too. So the recommendations, yeah, make sure the test fleet is representative by modifying the test aircraft to represent the future production lots. Test events that allocates resources uh, for the lot six as recommended, so even farther along. And then uh, high fidelity threat radar emulators so that they can actually see if it's going to be useful. So if we evaluate the statement about can it hold up against the Su-57, yes and no, right? So they said they looked at surrogate fifth generation adversary aircraft, but then they also talked about, yeah, but we didn't necessarily have uh, advanced longer range threat weapons that were tested. The mission tested did not include. So it's kind of a push, right? Yes, it was effective against what they tested, but is it all encompassing? No. As far as uh, the whole fifth gen hype, a lot of it's marketing. You know, stealth is not invisible. It's just lower radar cross section. So, you know, if you've got a good enough radar, you can see stuff. But it all comes down to can you use the sensors in the current environment and the threat? And what are you most likely to face? You know, they have to look at the scenarios that we're going to face. And as they pointed out in the report, there's not a whole lot of Su-57s right now. And there's not a whole lot of J-20s right now. But what are there a lot of? Su-30s, Su-35s, Su-27s, MiGs. So, yes, you have to worry about the next threat, but you also have to focus on the current threat. And against the current threat, and even the more advanced current threats, it did really well. So, this is an interesting example. The report is interesting. I'll leave a link in the description. But Boeing is doing great with the EX. And not so great with other stuff. So uh, they're doing great also with the Block 3 Super Hornet, which is also in this report. But it's just interesting. I wonder why that division, the fighter division, is so much better than everything else. Because everything else, like, you know, the civilian airliners, they're having problems, the KC-46, the T-7. It's just like, if they could just get it together and just copy what they're doing here, they would be unstoppable. But instead... It's just one bad story after another. But this is a good story. The EX is awesome. Is it really, you know, a fifth gen killer? I mean, it depends. That's always going to be the standard answer. So, uh, but I think it's a cool airplane. And I think guard units especially will benefit from it. You know, I think that's, you need your fifth gen fighters and your gen 4.5 fighters. And you need a lot of them. And I think this is a good way to do it. So uh, let me know in the comments what you think. Hope you guys enjoyed this episode. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.